The Grand Canal docks Dublin. The Silicon docks. Dublin's digital hub. It's an icon. It's an icon of success, an icon of regeneration, an icon of innovation, an icon of how Ireland can lead the world. But it may all be at risk. My name is Paul Dwyer. I'm a leader, a cyber leader, and for over 30 years I've worked fighting cyber bad guys around the world. I serve as president of the ICTTF, that's the International Cyber Threat Task Force, and over those years we have developed a community of like-minded cyber good guys that work together in a community that helps share information, collaborate, educate, and help fight against cyber evil around the world. On this TEDx, I'm going to talk about the future of cybersecurity. So we all live in two worlds. We live in the real physical world where there's laws, social norms and consequences to crime. But we also live in the cyber world, that digital world, where cyber crime is out of control. It's become a six trillion dollar economy. It has surpassed drug trafficking as the number one crime in the world. So that's the startling reality. But today I'm going to take the opportunity to tell you about the world's biggest cyber threat actor. And we're going to reveal him today on this talk. But first, let's put some more context on this. When the world leaders meet up, one of the biggest points on their agenda is cybersecurity. They talk about warfare, they talk about rules of engagement, they talk about what's allowed, what's not allowed. And this is going beyond just surveillance or, or just espionage. This is a, about attacking critical national infrastructure of countries and states around the world. And this is why it's such a hot topic when world leaders get together, because it's new ground. This new theater of war is what we call the internet. And we see the consequences on this, sometimes what we might refer to as collateral damage. When we see, for example, maybe the health sector being hit in, in a particular country, we see, you know, children maybe uh, not able to get their cancer treatments because of an attack from a cyber threat actor. And this is the issue. The issue is somewhere between a blurred line of crime, warfare and evil. And we're going to expose a little bit more of this as we go through now, guys. But I want to put a little bit more context on it before we get into uh, understanding the future. It's so important that we understand the present day situation we're dealing with. So there are various groups what we refer to as cyber threat actors. And these cyber threat actors have various levels of skills and various different kinds of objectives. But one thing they have in common is they all work together as a network. And it doesn't matter what their objective is. It could be to make money, it could be ideology, it could be power, it could be that they want to prey on the vulnerable like children. But they all work together as a network. And your adversary is somewhere overlapping all of these groups. One of the, if you like, downsides of living in such a digital connected society is that malefactors and evil can connect. And, and this is something that we see on a daily basis within the internet and within the underground economy of cybercrime itself. One of the manifestations of this we see even, for example, in relation to terrorism and terrorist activities. Here we see uh, terrorist uh, groups uh, purporting to be pushing an ideology, uh, maybe hijacking a, a really beautiful faith, uh, Shalom Aleichem, and they would take this and maybe radicalize using effectively grooming techniques that uh, pedophiles would use to groom and psychologically condition people to do things. Um, and those manifestations and those acts of violence would be carried out in the real physical world. And we saw this, unfortunately, uh, there's way too many examples of this, but one of those was the London Bridge bombings. And that was organized online via what was often referred to as a cyber caliphate, but it was funded and organized by mid-level cyber criminals carrying out activities such as invoice fraud um, from right here in Dublin. And, and this is what we need to realize. When we work on cybersecurity, when we defeat cyber evil, we are fighting against these kinds of forces, really a genuine evil force that we are, we are uh, disrupting and, and we're, we're taking them apart and we're preventing them from achieving their goals and their missions. So the elephant in the room is COVID. I've often referred to COVID as the most effective digital transformation officer in the world because COVID has effectively accelerated digital transformation projects. It has given us no choice but to move more of our lives online onto this digital ecosystem, um, a fragile 
digital ecosystem, I may add. Um, and, and of course, there's been some good out of that, but there's lots of risks that come with that kind of accelerated transformation. Um, we've had lots of warnings from law enforcement around the world and even the World Health Organization warning us about that, that, that increase in scams around that whole COVID piece, four or five hundred percent uh, escalation in scams being reported. Um, and this is from the likes of Interpol, Europol, even locally on Gardaí Corner, the National Cybersecurity Centre. Everybody's banging the drum and warning us that there's just a lot more going on with these sort of low-level scam artists. And we often refer to that kind of activity as spray and pray. It's a numbers game. It's a volume game. Um, and it's become so easy for people to become part of that uh, criminal community, that that entry-level piece and that, that almost warm network where they invite people to become part of that criminal network is uh, proliferating at a, a, a pace we've never seen before. But also on top of that, we also have groups that we refer to as OCGs, organized criminal groups. These kind of groups are, uh, by their name and definition, are a lot more organized and a lot more effective. And, and we tend to see those kind of um, uh, uh, entities uh, putting in a lot more time and investment into what we often refer to as low and slow attacks. And these are the kind of attacks that I think that we're going to really see um, the consequences of in the months ahead. Because these are the kind of attacks, these are the kind of threat actors that will have taken advantage on the fact that a lot of our workforces have been working from home in less than ideal conditions. We're talking about people that are distressed, discombobulated, distracted, maybe working on home residential uh, networks uh, in less than ideal conditions with, with no access to their colleagues and support and the normal kind of assurances that we would have had in place. And of course, a lot of people would refer to that kind of activity as, you know, shadow IT. But what I refer to it as almost as like people were trying to keep the show on the road. They, they were setting up systems via VPNs and re remote access to offices and systems and so on just to keep their businesses going, to transfer themselves online. It's understandable that kind of activity went on. But is it excusable now when there's been time for people to catch their breath and maybe look at the different sets of risks they have as a consequence of changing their business models and their operational models? And I think we're going to see huge consequences of that because these OCG groups will often take months, if not years, to infiltrate a large organization, a supply chain, a business value chain. And I'm reminded of the words of Christine Lagarde, which um, ironically was just before COVID. And uh, Christine, the president of, of the European Central Bank, warned the world that a cyber attack on, for example, the financial sector could effectively cause a liquidity crisis. Why? Because of that interconnected and interdependence between all of those entities. And if COVID has taught us one thing, it's that as humans on this planet, we are all interconnected, interdependent, and now even more dependent on this digital ecosystem that we rely on for our businesses and our lives and, and society in general. So crime, fraud, bad stuff, it's always been around. Often these uh, threat actors are just doing old stuff in a new way. And this cat and mouse game is something that goes on all the time. And, you know, it's about leveraging technology and innovation, artificial intelligence and new ways. And that's that cat and mouse game because as we, the good guys, start uh, coming with more innovative and, and uh, if you like, sexy technology and ways of defeating and, and preventing the, these uh, threat actors from carrying out their objectives, they too change and up their game. And it is that constant cat and mouse piece within the cybersecurity industry general. But we do have other challenges to contend with beyond the, uh, if you like, the modus operandi and the technical sort of defenses that we could put in place to detect, to prevent, to identify what's going on, to respond, to recover. Uh, there's a lot more going on. I mean, and I want to talk about one of the most significant challenges that we're facing in cybersecurity, and that's around education. So I believe we have a cyber skills challenge. Because here's some numbers for you. There's over 5 million open cybersecurity jobs around the world. That is to say there's over 5 million jobs that are looking for people to fill those roles. And they're in general, pure cybersecurity areas. Now there's another number I'll throw at you, which is that less than 10% of the industry is made up of women. And that's a shameful statistic. And even when we 
delve deeper into diversity within the industry, you know, there's a lot of heads being bowed down with shame because it needs to change. And we don't have anybody to fly the plane, so to speak, because we need people. And we need to get those people from different areas of business and different kinds of people. It's not all about security architects. It's not all about malware analysis. It's about communicators. It's about project leaders. It's about people who can handle anti-money laundering, compliance, all the various areas. Uh, areas uh, it's within the sales piece. It's within the, the human and cultural element of it. It's within the education space itself. And this is the challenge that we have. Now, at ICTTF, the International Cyber Threat Task Force, we thought we would do something about that this year. And on International Women's Day, we launched a cybersecurity boot camp for women. And I'm very proud to be able to tell you today that we have trained over 1,000 women around the world and introduced them to the cybersecurity industry, all free of charge, based on our, one of our initiatives uh, that we wanted to deliver this year. And that's something we're going to continue on for years to come because of the feedback and because it's expanding and the support we're getting with that around the world, we feel it's a very, very important initiative. And I'm proud to be an advocate for women in cybersecurity. Now, I want to warn you about a cyber threat actor that exists in plain sight. They have developed a piece of malware, bad tech, if you like that is being used all around the world. And in fact, we can reveal in this presentation that they actually run what we call a C2 server, a command and control server, right here from within the Grand Canal docks in Dublin. And I want you to understand that this technology is advanced beyond anything we've ever seen from a threat perspective. And I believe represents probably the biggest threat to our digital society that there is, if not the human race itself. So let me explain a little bit more about this as we reveal this cyber threat actor. Let's understand their advanced malware appeals to our baser instincts. It's able to trigger outrage, fear and hate. It literally propagates fake news and hatred. It's designed to do this. It's the business model and the mission of this threat actor. From here, they're able to provide a digital rabble rouser platform, if you like, that's available to the highest bidder. No morals or ethics required. You don't even have to prove who you are. Just provide a credit card and they'll support you and provide their services. They're not regulated and they're so powerful that normal rules such as GDPR, etc. just doesn't seem to bother them. They're digital overlords and their arrogance and lack of liability means they can operate with almost impunity. As internal whistleblowers continue to tell anecdotal stories which are akin to a car manufacturer turning off the airbags for children. The world seems just too busy and too desensitized to care. But let's remember what Oscar Wilde said. We live in an age when unnecessary things are the only necessity. This threat actor is supported by billions of people around the world that use his malware like addicts stuck in a ludic loop. The more it's used, the more fear and hatred it propagates, the more money it makes for the threat actor. You see, their business model is engagement, and spreading fear, hatred, and racism engages human beings. This malware uses our base vulnerabilities against us. They answer to nobody. There are no consequences. And, as we've seen with recent outages of their services, legitimate businesses are now vulnerable and tethered, if you like, to this giant teat of technology. Remember, guys, if it's online and it's free, you're the product. So meet Mark Zuckerberg. He heads up the development of this malware. Mark would argue to me that it's not malware. Well, okay, Mark, if it's just a defective product that kills children, spreads hate, undermines democracy, and poses a significant threat to civilization, well, then just fix it. Our new digital world, our digital ecosystem, all depends on a handful of American social media companies. This is the biggest cyber threat, the biggest cybersecurity issue of our day. If Cromwell was around today, he would have sorted the Irish question with a Facebook ad campaign. This propaganda machine for hate facilitates a data dictatorship that supports a policy of digital colonization and a hegemony. Uh, you know, just for one second, let's just consider something this malware propagates millions of times a day. That climate change is a hoax. Voltaire said, those who make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Need I say more? We need to regulate social media. So what can we do? Well, I believe we need to be as proud of our future as we are of our past. We need to embrace technology, artificial intelligence, every kind of piece of innovation technology that the world and the most incredible creative people can produce for us. But we need to do it with morals and ethics. And losing our cyber moral compass is a cyber risk in itself. So we need to learn how we manage cyber risk 
in all aspects of business, life and our digital society. And, you know, I believe Ireland can play a role in this, a significant role. I mean, we've, from time began, essentially, we have, you know, delivered way outside our weight division in relation to what we're able to do in the world from a positive impact, whether it was the Hungarian Revolution, the Congo, Live Aid, we can make an impact in the world. And I believe we can lead the world in this space around cybersecurity and managing risk and being able to empower and protect digital societies and keep people safe from this technology. And I mean, there's one more thing to consider here in relation to social media companies. The genocide in Myanmar was facilitated by Facebook. So we need to look at technology really from this ethical and moral standpoint, because I believe that's the biggest risk. And that's what we need to be able to, to deal with um, so that we can be as proud of our future as we are of our past. In concluding, I'd like to paraphrase the words of John F. Kennedy as he addressed the Irish Parliament in 1963, when the world itself was on the brink of nuclear disaster. Some may say this means little to Ireland in an age where history moves with the tramp of earthquake feet. In an age where literally a handful of men and nations have the power to devastate mankind. In an age where the needs of the emerging nations are so great and staggering that even the richest nations often groan with the burden of assistance. In such an age, it may be asked, how can a country as small as Ireland play much of a role on a world stage? Well, Ireland's never been rich or powerful, but yet since the earliest times, our impact and influence on the world has been both rich and powerful. This is an extraordinary country George Bernard Shaw, speaking as an Irishman, summed up an approach to life. Others, he said, see things and ask why. But I, I dream of things that never were and I ask why not. And it's that quality, it's that quality of the Irish, that remarkable combination of hope, imagination and confidence that's required more than ever before. The problems of the world cannot possibly be solved by skeptics or cynics whose horizons are limited by obvious realities. We need men and women that can dream of things that never were and ask, why not? It matters not how small or humble a nation is when clad in the armour of a righteous cause, be it they seek world peace or freedom, for they are then stronger than all the forces of error. So yes, I believe Ireland can lead the world in this space. I believe the world needs those ethics and morals and leadership that Ireland can provide in relation to helping keep a digital society both safe and secure.